Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module which is Biosphere. Now you'll remember that Biosphere is one of the four spheres on this planet. We have already looked at Lithosphere which is the rocky sphere or the solid sphere, Hydrosphere which is the watery sphere or the liquid sphere, Atmosphere which is the gaseous sphere or the airy sphere and now we are talking about the Biosphere. Now biosphere is the living sphere. It is at the confluence of all the three other spheres, lithosphere, hydrosphere and atmosphere. Now this is because most plants and animals need soil to live in or to get their nutrients from. They require water and they also need air. So it is at the confluence of all the three spheres that we have the biosphere. And in this module, we will have three lectures soil, life on earth and biodiversity. So let us begin with soil. So what is soil? Soil can be defined as a collection of natural bodies on the earth's surface containing living matter and supporting or capable of supporting plants. So it is a collection of natural bodies, natural bodies of different sizes. So they can be coarse particles, they can be fine particles. And these natural bodies exist on the earth's surface. And they either contain living matter or they support plants or they are capable of supporting plants. Meaning that even if we have an area where these matter are not currently supporting plants, but they are capable of supporting plants, even then we will call it a soil. Which means that if you consider a forest and after a severe forest fire, all the living organisms in that area, including the plants, they are dead. Now, if that happens, do we still call that area soil? The answer is yes, because even though there are no plants and animals on that area currently, but this area is still capable of supporting plants. And so we'll say that this area still has soil that is left after the forest fire. So soil is a collection of natural bodies on the earth's surface containing living matter and supporting or capable of supporting plants. Another definition is it is a mixture of rock debris and organic materials which develops on the surface of the earth. So this second definition focuses on the creation of the soil. And it says that soil is nothing but a mixture of rock debris and organic materials. So we have the debris, which means we have fragments of rocks and we have organic materials and soil is a mixture of both of these, which develops on the surface of the earth. The importance of soil is that it is the medium that supports plant growth and plants support all the life on this planet because any animal would require plants as a source of food. Plants convert the energy of sunlight into food for all the living organisms by doing photosynthesis. And in the process of photosynthesis, they take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they take water from the land, they take nutrients from the soil and they make glucose or they make other carbohydrates. And so the function of soil as a medium of supporting plant growth is also something that supports all the life on this planet. Now what is soil made of? If you look at soil, it is made up of four different things. We have mineral particles. Now these mineral particles, they have derived from different rocks. So these are the fragments of rocks. And we had observed before that rocks are made up of minerals. There is no specific 
constitution of minerals in a rock there is no specific composition but the fact is that rocks are made up of minerals and so when the rocks get broken down these minerals become available so the first fragment is mineral particles second we have humus humus is the organic material so when we have plants when we have animals then their excreta or their dead portions after getting decomposed they become humus so humus is the organic material it is rich in carbon and it provides a large amount of chemical properties to the soil it provides a large number of physical properties to the soil it binds the soil together it ensures that this the acidity or the alkalinity of the soil does not vary too much it gives it a buffering agent so this is the second fraction third we have water so soils retain a lot of moisture so if you take a sample of soil you will find that it also has water plus the space between mineral particles that is not filled with humus or water that contains air so these are the four components of soil mineral particles humus water and air now how do soils form soil formation occurs through the weathering of rocks which is the parent material and deposition of organic materials over time so there are two processes we have the weathering of rocks and rocks are the parent material that form the soil so the first process is weathering of rocks and the second process is the deposition of organic matter over time and soil formation is also known as pedogenesis and we can represent pedogenesis as the conversion of rocks into soil now this process will comprise of weathering which is the breaking up of rocks transportation of the broken fragments action of heat air water and chemicals and also the action of biological organisms which generates humus in the soil now these biological organisms can play a role in weathering they can play a role in transportation or they can play a role in putting certain physical or chemical changes in the soil and at the same time they lead to the deposition of humus in the soil the organic matter now these biological organisms include bacteria mosses lichens grasses ferns shrubs trees animals so essentially all of different kinds of organisms can play a role in soil formation and when all of these act together then rock gets converted into soil now when we talk about soil what are the parent minerals that are found in the soil the parent materials are derived from the rocks and the primary materials include quartz calcite feldspar and mica so these are the four minerals that form the majority of mineral component of most of the soils so these are the four minerals that we commonly find in different soils now let us have a look at weathering we have discussed weathering before and weathering is defined as the process of wearing or being worn by long exposure to the atmosphere so essentially it is a process of wearing or a process of being broken into smaller fragments so through the process of weathering the rocks get broken into very small fragments and weathering occurs by long exposure to the atmosphere now there are three different kinds of weathering physical chemical and biological weathering physical weathering could include mechanisms such as thermal stresses which means that if there is a rock and when this rock is exposed to the sun then in the day time the portion that gets exposed to the sun it becomes warmer and when it becomes hot it expands and in the night time this portion becomes cool and it contracts back so essentially this process of continuous expansion and contraction of the rock can lead to the development of certain breakages in this rock or fractures in this rock and when the the rock breaks it 
breaks into fragments and this breakage is weathering. So rocks can break because of thermal stresses. This is a mechanism of physical weathering. Another is frost weathering or cryofracturing, in which case if water enters into the rock, then after a while this water, when it cools, especially in those areas that have very cold areas, then this water will get converted into ice. And the volume of ice is greater than the volume of water. And so there will be an outward force that gets applied to this area. And when this outward force is applied, then the rock develops cracks. And with, when this process goes on and on, because once you have the crack, then water can enter to a greater depth which means that next time when it cools, then a larger portion will get converted into ice. So now we have a larger block of ice inside, which means there will be an even greater amount of force that gets applied, which means that you get an even greater crack. And in this way, the rock becomes cryofractured. Another mechanism is the mechanical action of ocean waves. Now we have observed before that the ocean waves, when they bump against the rocks, they can break the rocks and they can result in very large size formations such as cliffs or terraces or sea caves or the sea stacks. Now when such an action occurs, then the portion that has been broken down, that is the weathered portion of the rock. Now at not just through the mechanical action, but the sea waves can also make use of the sand that they carry. And this sand can act as a sandpaper to further weather the rocks. So this is another uh, physical weathering mechanism. Yet another mechanism is the release of pressure due to erosion of overlying layers. And we also have the salt crystal growth, which is very similar to cryofracturing, but utilizing the growth of salt crystals. And this is very commonly observed near the sea coast. Chemical weathering, as we have seen before, in includes chemical reactions such as carbonation, dissolution or solution, hydration with increase in volume, hydrolysis, oxidation and reduction reactions. And biological weathering is a combination of both physical and chemical methods, such as the physical push action of roots and the release of acids. Now, once all of this has happened, then we have a rock that has been broken down into smaller fragments. Now, how does this fragment turn into a soil? So that would depend on a number of other factors. So soil formation is dependent upon these six factors. The first and the most important one is the parent material or the rock. Now, different rocks have different minerals in them. And so the soil that will get formed will depend on the kind of parent material that it has begun from. So for example, the felsic rocks will give rise to very different soils. The mafic rocks will give rise to very different soils. At the same time, the ease of weathering of a rock also depends on its own structure, its own composition. Now, if a rock is easily weatherable rock, it's a soft rock, then it will very soon be converted into soil. Common examples are the sedimentary rocks, especially those that are rich in calcium carbonates. On the other hand, those rocks that are very hard, that are very strong, they take a lot of time to convert into soil. Good examples are the igneous rocks. They are very hard. So soil formation is dependent on the parent material or the rock to begin with. It is also dependent on the relief of the area, which means what is the difference between higher elevations and the lower elevations. Now, if an area is a flat land, in that case, we will not find water that moves at a very fast speed. Whereas if the area is having a high relief, so there are certain areas that are very high. There are certain areas which are very low. In such cases, water will move at a much faster rate. And when water moves at a faster rate, then we will have more amount of mechanical weathering of the rocks. 
not only because this water will be uh, bumping against the rocks but at the same time the fragments that it carries that they will also lead to erosion of these rocks so relief also plays a role relief also determines where the uh, these fragments will get collected so for instance if we have a hilly area and there is lot of weathering that is happening in this area where would these fragments go so it, it turns out that these fragments will move down because of gravity and they will get accumulated here so in this case this area will have soil very quickly whereas this area will not have soil that quickly so the relief determines not just the action of various agents of weathering but it also determines where the soil or the mineral particles will get accumulated next we have climate now many of the physical and chemical processes of weathering are dependent on climate so when we talk about thermal stresses it depends on what is the difference between the daytime and the nighttime temperatures if the difference is very much then there are large physical stresses that get developed if the area has a more equable temperature which means that day and night temperatures are not that different then probably thermal stresses will not play a major role in the weathering of the rocks similarly when we talk about chemical reactions such as solution or dissolution now that is dependent on the availability of water so this will not uh, be a major uh, factor in the case of arid areas which do not have a lot of rainfall but they will be very important factors in areas that receive a heavy rainfall so climate also plays a role when we talk about cryo fracturing it depends on temperatures going so low that water freezes into ice again a role of climate so climate also plays a major role in soil formation similarly vegetation and other life forms they also play a role why because we have the biological weathering so if an area has vegetation and life forms then biological weathering also plays a role but it does not play a role in those areas that do not have vegetation or life forms at the same time humus is an important constituent of the soil and humus can only be there if you have vegetation and life forms because it is derived from living materials so veg vegetation and life forms also play a role in soil formation human activities also play a role why because in certain areas we are breaking up the rocks we are doing mining operations and in those areas the rocks are very easily getting weathered into smaller fragments on the other hand in certain areas we are doing protection activities which are saving the rocks from getting weathered so human activities also play a role and time plays a very important role because the activity of various agents of weathering whether it is physical chemical or biological it takes time a rock will not break down into fragments in a day it will take many days or perhaps many months or even many years for the rock to break apart into smaller fragments so it is possible that you have a rock you have good agents of weathering but still you do not find the rock getting weathered because this area has just come up the rocks were not exposed to the agents of weathering for a very long period of time and with time these rocks will also get weathered so time is a very important factor in soil formation so soil formation is dependent on the parent material or the rock especially its hardness and constitution the relief of the area the climate of the area vegetation and other life forms human activities and time now what does soil look like so if you take soil you can separate it on the basis of the fragment size so we can have different soil separates in a sample of soil so essentially what we do to look at soil separates is that you take a sample of soil and you put it through a sieve
so you take the soil you crush it or essentially you dry it and you um, handle it in such a way that the particles separate from each other and then you push it through a sieve now in any sieve the particles that are larger than the mesh size they will stay on the top and the particles that are smaller they will pass through so in this way we can use sieves or meshes of different sizes so we have a coarse mesh followed by a fine mesh followed by an even finer mesh and in this way we can separate the soil into its constituents on the basis of their sizes and when we do that these are the fragments that we will get those portions that have a diameter between 1 to 2 mm they are known as very coarse sand fragments above 2 mm in size are not classified as soil separates we call them either rocks or pebbles or rock fragments then on a finer scale we will have particles between 0.5 to 1 mm in size and we co call them as coarse sand particles between 0.25 to 0.5 mm in diameter are medium sand then we have fine sand from 0.1 to 0.25 mm very fine sand from 0.05 to 0.1 mm silt which is 0.002 mm to 0.05 mm and clay comprising of all those fragments that have a diameter of less than 0.002 mm so this is soil separates when we talk about soil separates we are classifying the fragments in the soil on the basis of their sizes and the amount of these different soil separates or their ratios will determine the texture of the soil now texture refers to the feel appearance and consistency of the soil what does the soil feel like if you hold it in your hands does it feel as a very coarse soil or does it feel like a very fine soil what is the appearance of the soil does it look like comprising of coarse materials or does it look like comprising of finer materials what is the consistency of the soil is it having a uniform consistency or is it having certain areas that have bulks and certain other areas that are very fine so texture refers to the feel appearance and consistency of the soil and it is determined by the relative proportions of clay silt sand etc in the soil so essentially it is determined by the relative proportions of various soil separates now texture influences soil porosity permeability infiltration shrink and swell rate water holding capacity and susceptibility to erosion of the soil and we'll look at these different features in a short while and soil texture is classified into a clay texture so a clay texture means that you have an abundance of clay that is most of the uh, particles in the soil are very fine in diameter then we have sandy clay we have silty clay which means that we have clay with sand or clay with silt then we have a sandy texture which which means that the majority of the fragments are sand we have loamy sand now loamy sand means that you have a combination of clay silt and sand but it is towards sandy texture then we have silt we have loam loam is a very good mixture of clay silt and sand clay loam sandy loam silt loam sandy clay loam and silty clay loam so these are different soil textures together with texture we also have the structure of the soil structure refers to the arrangement of the solid parts of the soil and the pore spaces that are located between them that is the soil comprises of the soil separates but how are these soil separates aggregated together are the soil separates aggregated into large size aggregates or small size aggregates what is the shape of those aggregates so that determines the structure of the soil so it is determined by clumping binding and aggregation of the soil granules and it influences water and air movement biological activity 
root growth and seedling emergence types include platy prismatic columnar blocky granular wedge and lenticular so when we talk about soil structure we are asking the question how are the aggregates distributed in the soil so for instance if the soil is made up of aggregates that are say spherical so in this case the aggregates can never fit closely together as compared to aggregates that are say in the form of sheets now in the case of such an arrangement if water needs to pass it can very easily pass through this soil but in this aggregate the water will take a lot of time because it has to move through all these tortuous locations and so the aggregates determine the properties of the soil how easy is it for water to move through this soil or for instance if there is a seed germination that is going on so there is a seed below the soil and it wants to germinate how easy is it for the young plant to come up if the aggregate is a coarse aggregate the structure is a coarse structure then the plants can come out very easily but in the case of such a packed structure the plant will find it very difficult to come out and probably it will die there so structure influences water and air movement biological activity root growth and seedling emergence the types include platy in which case the aggregates are in the form of plates something like this or we can have prismatic now prismatic would mean that you have the aggregates in the shape of prisms something like this or we can have columnar in which case the aggregates form columns or we can have blocky aggregates or granular aggregates so this is an example of a granular aggregate a blocky aggregate would mean creation of block like structures wedge shaped structures lenticular which means lens shaped aggregates so lens shaped aggregates would be something like this or they could be something like this so all of these different structures can be found in the soil and they determine or influence the properties of the soil what properties properties including the water holding capacity how much water does the soil hold so for instance if you talk about sand sand has a low water holding capacity why because sand is made up of coarse particles large size particles and these large size particles have lots of pores in between them and so if you put water the water will just flow out but if the particles are very small in size in that case they become more densely packed there is less amount of pore space and if you try to put water then water will be retained in all of these spaces in the form of capillary water and very less amount of water will be released from this soil so essentially if the soil is a clay soil it has a high water holding capacity if it is a sandy soil then it has a low water holding capacity seed uh, silt is in between medium to high aeration now aeration also depends on the pores sand having good amount of pores will have good aeration clay having particles that are close together will have a poor aeration silt will be in mid between drainage rate again a very similar thing how fast does water move through the soil if it is comprised mostly of sand or comprised of structures that have large sized aggregates then you have a high drainage rate in the ca case of clay it has a poor drainage rate silt is in between soil organic matter level now because clay has large amount of water so it will also have more amount of organic matter so uh, soil organic matter is high to medium 
In the case of sand, it is low. In the case of silt, it is medium to high. Decomposition of organic matter. In the case of sand, there is a rapid decomposition. Why? Because there is a very good amount of aeration. In the case of clay, there is a slow decomposition because the aeration is poor and it very easily creates anaerobic conditions in which decomposition is hindered and silt comes in between. Susceptibility to wind erosion. In the case of sand, it is moderate because the particles are of large weights. They have more mass. But if it is fine sand, then it can very easily get eroded by wind. So we have looked at the example of sand dunes. And in the case of sand dunes, wind acts as the agent of erosion. Now, in the case of sand dunes, if there is fine sand, then the sand dune can very easily get eroded. But if the sand is very coarse sand, then wind will have to do a lot more work. In the case of silt, there is a high susceptibility to wind erosion because it has particles of different sizes. So talk uh, if you have winds that are of any speed, there will be some particle that can very easily get eroded. In the case of clay, it has a low susceptibility to wind erosion, even though it has very fine particles. Why? Because it has a high amount of water holding capacity. So the soil is mostly wet. Not only is it wet, but it is also high in soil organic matter, which acts as a binding agent and it keeps the soil together. And so the susceptibility to wind erosion is low. If you talk about water erosion, then again, in the case of sand, the susceptibility is low unless it is fine in size. For silt, it is high. In the case of clay, if it is aggregated, that is if it has formed a structure by clumping of uh, the soil particles, then it has a low susceptibility. Otherwise, it has a high susceptibility because the particles are small in size and they can easily move with water. Now, when we talk about water erosion, we are talking about a situation where a lot of water is there with the soil. And so the soil very easily gets into a suspension mode and so it can very easily be removed. Now, this is unlike the case of wind erosion in which case if the soil is wet then wind finds it difficult to move the soil because of the aggregation effect but in the case of water erosion so much amount of water is available that the clumping action of water does not play any role here shrink and swell potential it is moderate to high in the case of clay because clay is a soil that swells and shrinks so if you take clay, if you add water, the volume will expand. When it dries, it becomes smaller in size. So it shrinks. Now this property is very specific to clay and it plays a very big role in the case of agriculture. Because remember that clay has poor aeration, but because of the shrink and swell uh, potential of clay, it permits it to aerate itself. That is. In the summer season, what will happen is you have clay and if you look at the clay, when it dries, it will shrink. So when it shrinks, then different portions are moving towards each other. When that happens, the regions in between, they develop cracks. And through these cracks, air can reach inside. So the cracks play a very important role to aerate the soil. So the shrink and swell potential is moderate to very high in the case of clay, low in the case of silt and sand hardly has any shrink and swelling potential. Then if we talk about the sealing potential for ponds, dams and landfills, clay is used as a very good sealant. Because of its small size particles, it can fill in all the gaps and all the pores that are there at the bottom of the pond, which makes the bottom of the pond a watertight structure and it retains water. Now this is possible because the clay has very fine particle size. So the sealing potential of clay is good, but for sand and silt, it is poor. Suitability for tillage after rain. So after it has rained, 
clay becomes swelled it becomes sticky so once it has rained it is very difficult to till the clay it is very easy to till sand because sand does not retain water it does not swell it does not become sticky silt comes in between pollutant leaching potential if sand has any pollutant with it the moment you get water water moves through the sand and it takes the pollutant and the pollutant leaches away into the water body so it has a high pollutant leaching potential clay has a low pollutant leaching potential because it just does not permit water to pass that easily except when it is cracked because of shrinkage silt comes in between ability to store plant nutrients is high in the case of clay not only because it has very smaller size part very small size particles but at the same time be because it also has a lot of organic matter sand has a poor ability to store plant nutrients silt comes in between resistance to ph change in the case of clay it has a high resistance to ph change why because it has a lot of organic matter and this organic matter acts as a buffer so it does not permit the acidity or the alkalinity of the soil to change very easily now because sand has very less amount of organic matter so there is a very low resistance to ph changes silt comes in between so here we are observing that the composition of the soil in terms of what fractions are present in the soil what fractions dominate in the soil they determine to a large extent the properties of the soil now when we talk about structures then structures also play a role here so in the case of clay if you have a clay soil with a coarse structure with a granular structure then it will behave like sand for some of the properties not all so the structure and the composition of the soil plays a big role in determining the properties of the soil and in this context let us also talk about the soil profile here we can define soil horizons which is a layer of soil which is parallel to the surface whose physical chemical and biological characteristics are different from those of the layer above and the layer below so essentially what we are saying here is that if you consider a sample of soil that has just been dug out so we have taken a core of soil from the earth now in this case all the soil that is there on the top it is being exposed to very similar conditions it is directly in contact with air probably all of it is getting heated by the sun and so on whereas a layer which is inside has probably less amount of exposure to air similarly whenever water moves through this soil it moves through gravity so it moves from top to bottom once that happens then some of the constituents of the soil may get leached away which means that water takes them away now when once water takes them away they have to be deposited somewhere so it is possible that some of those leachants are deposited here so essentially soil comes in the form of layers and these layers are parallel to the surface and the properties of these layers are determined by the layers above and their position in the soil so this is what soil horizon talks about soil horizon is a layer of soil parallel to the surface whose physical chemical and biological characteristics are different from those of the layer above and the layer below and soil horizons are easily seen by differences in color and texture so it is possible that on the top you have a dark colored soil why dark colored because this will have a lot of humus whenever you have any leaves that fall to this area they get converted into humus and they form a dark colored soil whereas towards the bottom you will probably have a very sandy soil light colored soil so these layers these horizons can be identified by differences in color and texture and also by differences in their physical and chemical properties 
and soil profile refers to the vertical arrangement of these soil horizons how are they arranged and typically we find these soil horizons the top layer is the organic surface layer it is comprised of undecomposed and decomposing litter so when we talk about the soil this layer is the o horizon the organic horizon it comprises of undecomposed matter and decomposing matter in different stages of decomposition after that we have top soil top soil is a layer of mineral soil with organic matter and soil life it may be alluviated where minerals are leased to the lower layers typically this is the most important layer of the soil when we talk about things such as forestry or agriculture because this is the layer that the plant roots come most in contact with and this is the layer which if it is fertile then it will help the plants to grow very fast so top soil is the mineral layer so as against the organic layer this is now a layer of mineral soil but it also has organic matter which is coming from the o horizon and it also has soil life so it has a lot many insects it has earthworms it has fungus so there are various kinds of um, biotic organisms that are there in this layer but this layer may be alluviated where minerals are leased to the lower layers why because when you have a rainfall then this layer can lose certain minerals which then move downwards after top soil we have the subsoil it is a layer of mineral soil with much less organic matter and soil life than the top soil so on the top we have the organic surface layer and any organic matter is moving from top to bottom so here we will have the maximum amount of organic matter and as we go down we will have less and less amount of organic matter in the case of subsoil we have more minerals and less organic matter in soil life color is derived mostly from iron oxides and it may show alluviation or deposition of minerals and organic compounds so the things that were removed from the top soil may get deposited in the subsoil below the subsoil we have the substratum which is a layer of poorly weathered and unweathered rocks so this comprises of those rocks that are in various stages of being weathered or being worn out so when we talk about the substratum it will comprise of different sized fragments of rocks some big size fragments some smaller size fragments and there is very little if any soil life or organic matter in this layer and below the substratum we have the bedrock which is a continuous mass of hard rock so this is a typical soil profile but different soils may have some one or more of these layers missing which brings us to the classification of soil all the soils are not the same soils are different and if you can identify the kind of soil it can help you in planning certain activities so certain soils are good for forests certain soils are good for grasslands certain soils are very poor so we can classify soils to understand their properties to understand their characteristics so why do we need to classify soils one because they tell us about the history of the soil how did this soil come into existence now soil formation is dependent upon the parent rocks relief topography climate and time and so the soil that exists at a place can give us an idea about the past history of this area so for instance if you go to an area and you find certain minerals that are very much found in a particular soil say your soil has a lot of placer gold deposits so this can give you an idea that okay this soil has come from an area where the rocks bear gold now similarly we can look at the mineral composition to understand what are the rocks that were the parent material for this soil how did this soil come into existence what were the weathering agents was it weathered by air was it weathered by water and what was the morphology or the geomorphology of the area because depending on the geomorphology different agents of weathering would play a very different role we can get an idea about whether this area had life or not 
so soil tells us about the history of the area and soil also regulates plant life so we get a good idea about the vegetation that will be supported in different areas the kind of biodiversity that different soils will be able to support now this is why we classify soils now we can classify soils in various ways the early classification especially from the point of view of a farming community would be to classify soils on the basis of fertility is it a fertile soil or is it a sterile soil fertile soils in india are known as urvara soils and the sterile soils are known as usar soils now a soil can be urvar or usar because of several different reasons probably it has a mineral that is absent or probably it has too much of soil or salt or probably it has very high ph or very low ph so there are n number of things that can make a soil fertile or infertile so this early classification it just gives an idea about the fertility it does not tell us why a soil is fertile or infertile it does not tell us about how this soil came into existence but this was the the early classification of soils next we moved into texture so soils can be classified into sandy soils which have a predominance of sand silty soils clay soils or loamy soils now loamy soils have a roughly equal uh, proportion of sand silt and clay so this was a classification based on texture now classification on the basis of fertility or classification on the basis of texture is easy to do so which is why these are early modes of classification yet another early mode of classification is classification on the basis of color is it a red colored soil is it a yellow colored soil is it a black colored soil and so on but now the modern classification compiles all of this information together and now we classify soils on the basis of their genesis which is how they came into existence their history the color the composition and the location so now when you classify soil into one of these eight categories alluvial black red and yellow laterite arid saline pt and forest now when you classify soil into one of these categories you can get an idea about the genesis the color the composition and the location of the soil so let us now understand this classification the first is alluvial soils now alluvial soils are depositional soils they are transported and deposited by rivers and streams and so they are found in deltas and river valleys so when we talked about the northern plains of india we said that they are comprised out of the alluvial uh, soils that were deposited by the various rivers in this area indus and its tributaries ganga and its tributaries brahmaputra and its tributaries now all of these rivers were carrying sediments and once they moved out of the mountainous areas and they shifted to the plain areas the speed reduced they were not able to transport as well and so they shed their sediments now these sediments form the alluvial soil so this soil is found in deltas such as the sundarban delta and in river valleys such as our northern plains this soil may be sandy loam to clay so very near to the foothills the soil will be more coarser because when the speed reduces the first thing that the river would shed would be the coarser particles because they require too much amount of energy to transport and once the soil uh, once, once the river has reached into the plain area it now no longer has that amount of kinetic energy but then at a distance from the foothills you will find more of clay soil so this soil may be sandy loam to clay it is rich in potash and poor in phosphorus we have two different kinds of alluvium we have khadar which is new alluvium deposited by floods annually and we have bangar which is the old alluvium and has been deposited away from the flood plains the soil may have kankar deposits kankar refers to calcium carbonate which is in the form of aggregates the color varies from light gray to ash gray these are fertile soils intensely cultivated because of which our northern plains have become the bread basket of the country 
and in india they are widespread in northern plains and the river valleys another soil is black soil also known as regar soil or black cotton soil because it is used for cotton cultivation these are clay soils too much of clay so when you say clay now you can think about the various characteristics that clay would be giving to these soils they are deep soils they are impermeable soils because clay does not allow water to pass that easily they have a high swell and shrink character given by the clay they swell and become sticky when wet they shrink when dry gives them a self plowing character because large cracks develop in the summer season facilitate absorption of water permitting rain fed agriculture and cotton is widely cultivated this soil is rich in lime iron magnesium and potassium lacks phosphorus nitrogen and organic matter so basically if you want to use this soil for cultivation you need to add phosphorus nitrogen and organic matter because the soil is poor in that the color varies from deep black to gray and in india it covers most of the deccan plateau now when you say that it covers most of the deccan plateau you can get an idea about the origin of this soil most of this soil has originated from igneous rocks because igneous rocks are the ones that cover most of the deccan plateau especially the flood basalt provinces so this is the origin of the black soils next we have red and yellow soils they develop in low rainfall areas with crystalline igneous rock bed they have red color because of iron and when they are hydrated they appear yellow in color which is why they are called red and yellow soils fine grained soils are fertile whereas coarse grained soils are poor in fertility so they can be either fine grained or coarse grained they are deficient in nitrogen phosphorus and humus so essentially most, mostly they are infertile commonly found in the eastern part of the deccan plateau so they can be put to agricultural use by fulfilling all of these deficiencies next we have laterite soils the name is derived from latin later which means brick so they were used for brick making so they are not good for most of other purposes which means that they have poor fertility they develop in areas with high temperature and rainfall which leads to intense leaching of materials due to tropical rains which removes lime silica whereas iron oxide and aluminum compounds are left behind giving the reddish color so these are red in color because of iron oxides humus content is fast removed by bacteria because they are found in areas with high temperature and rainfall so any humus is very quickly degraded so they are poor in humus so they are poor in organic matter nitrogen phosphorus and calcium they are rich in iron oxide and potassium and can be put to agricultural use through application of manure and fertilizers that is by fulfilling the deficiencies they are commonly found in high uh, higher areas of peninsular plateau in the states of karnataka kerala tamil nadu madhya pradesh and odisha that is all the areas that have high temperature and rainfall we have arid soils which is dry soils think about desert and you understand the arid soils they are sandy soils generally saline as well which means that they have high amounts of salt red to brown in color lack moisture lack humus low in nitrogen lower layers have kanker layers which is calcium carbonate which makes it impermeable so when water is made available plants can thrive because of this layer of kanker nodules but if these soils are heavily plowed and this kanker layer is broken then all the water will be very quickly drained off and you cannot perform any agriculture here in india they are found in rajasthan and gujarat we have saline soils which are infertile soils with high salt content most of the plants just die in the saline soils they are rich in sodium potassium and magnesium often a result of dry climate and poor drainage they occur in arid and semi arid regions and in water logged in swampy areas so basically if you have an area where you get water from the rivers but this water has been brought artificially and it evaporates so the salts that are there in the water they get 
accumulated in the soil and with time this soil will become more and more salty it can also become salty if people apply too much of fertilizers especially the chemical fertilizers and once the soil is very salty then plants are unable to absorb moisture because the osmolarity goes haywire and so they are very poor uh, in fertility they may also be a result of sea water intrusion deposition of salt particles through wind or excessive use of fertilizers we have peaty soils which are very high in organic carbon just think about lots of organic carbon so they are found in areas of high rainfall high humidity lots of vegetation dead organic matter accumulates giving a black color to this soil too much of humus organic matter may be as high as 50% may be alkaline in ph commonly found in areas like bihar west bengal odisha and tamil nadu then we have forest soils found in forest areas with sufficient rainfall structure and texture vary a lot because these are forest soils so you will not find a very consistent structure and texture which is why they have not been put into agricultural use they are typically not very fertile in upper reaches they may be coarse grained whereas in the valley sides they may be loamy and silty so basically the composition the structure the texture the fertility everything is variable in the case of forest soils now apart from this classification we also have the modern classification by the us department of agriculture which divides soil into 12 orders so here we have alfi soils which are soils that are rich in aluminum and iron andy soils which are soils of volcanic ash aridy soils which are soils of desert areas that is our arid soils anti soils which are soils of recent origin such as those found in steep slopes now in the steep slopes because the soils did not have a lot of time to accumulate so there is no horizon development jelly soils which are the soils of permafrost areas histosols which are very much like our peaty soils they are a large storehouse of carbon insepti soils which are very beginning soils minimum horizon development but more than anti soils molly soils which is a soft soil which is found in grassland areas typically a majority of them have been shifted into agricultural use oxy soil which is rich, rich in oxides spodo soils which is uh, a soil with wood ash color so these are acidic soils with subsurface accumulation of humus complex with iron and aluminum they support forests alti soils which are uh, last soils which means that they are strongly leased they are soils with low fertility generally red in color verti soils which means uh, clay rich soils similar to our black soils so they are clay rich soils that shrink and swell with a self ploughing capability so we have different kinds of soils soils play a very important role in supporting forests and in supporting biodiversity so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind